Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Domestic Violence and Strangulation, the third program in our Domestic Violence Month webinar series. We're so glad you could join us. My name is Amy Goal, and I'm the Director of Education for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. The partnership is providing today's program. Just a few pieces of information that I need to share before we get started. To receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. This survey will be sent to you in an email, there'll be a link, and you'll receive that email within one hour after the webinar ends. Certificates of completion will also be sent via email within one week of the program. Today's program is being recorded and will be available through the partnership's website until October 14, 2022. All of the attendees' microphones will be muted today during the presentation, but we encourage you to write your questions in the question box and our speaker will respond to as many as possible at the end of her presentation. And now I'd like to present uh, Daniel Francois. Danielle is the Health and Outreach Coordinator with the Essex County Family Justice Center. She has almost 10 years of experience working in the field of domestic violence. Danielle has spent over four years in direct services working with survivors and another four and a half years delivering training on the health impacts of domestic violence and strangulation to multidisciplinary professionals. Danielle holds a master's in public health from Montclair State University, and as you will learn, is dedicated to violence prevention, education, and trauma-informed practices. Thank you, Danielle, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, the partnership, for putting on these uh, education series and for dedicating uh, the whole month of October for focusing on domestic violence. Um, so I'm going to not share my uh, camera while I'm doing my presentation, just so that you guys can focus on my slides because I move around a lot. I, I talk with my hands and I don't want to be distracting. I want you guys to be able to focus on what I'm talking about. So, um, but I'll come back um, for uh, the, the Q&A. So, so we're gonna be talking about domestic violence and strangulation today, but first I just want to, again, thank you so much for joining. Um, and I, I hope that everybody's been doing well, and I hope that everybody um, and their families have been safe and healthy during the pandemic. Um, and so as Amy mentioned, I am the Health and Outreach Coordinator from Essex County Family Justice Center. We're located in Newark, New Jersey. We provide co-located services for survivors of domestic violence. Um, we provide all these services under one roof through a partnership with governmental and non-governmental agencies. So what that means is um, all of our services are provided through partnerships with uh, law enforcement, uh, civil legal services, and community-based organizations. The purpose of a family justice center um, is to provide as many of these services as much as possible under one roof so that the survivor doesn't have to go from place to place in order to get these services and um, eliminating the need or uh, you know, feeling that they are doing this alone um, and therefore they're less likely to drop charges, go back to the relationship and, and hopefully move forward um, with their healing journey. So uh, we operate under a national model though. We are the first family justice center in the state of New Jersey. There's currently four, and there's currently over, I believe 150 operating FJCs in the United States. So I know that there are some people that might be out of state. So um, you can contact me or you can um, you know, search uh, if, if your county or your state has a family justice center. Um, so that you can you you can connect with them. Oh, don't know why that popped back up. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so Amy already mentioned this, so we don't have to go through this. 
So our workshop objectives today, um, we're just going to quick go over uh, what domestic violence is, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then we're going to really go into strangulation, um, review the signs and symptoms of strangulation, uh, um, go over some screening questions if you're working with somebody um, who's a survivor of strangulation, and then provide some advocacy tips and, and ways that you can connect with your community-based resources um, so that you know you can connect your survivors and your patients with the um, appropriate services. So first off, what is domestic violence, intimate partner violence? Um, we'll go through this definition really quickly. So domestic violence is a pattern of behavior that is used by one partner to maintain power and control over another partner in an intimate relationship. The key word here is pattern. Um, it is not just one incident. It is not just out of anger. It is not, although it can be, um, uh, it could be because of, um, you know, somebody was under the influence of drugs or alcohol, but um, it's never an excuse for it. It is a pattern that is continuing throughout the relationship. And it's not just physical, right? We, we tend to think that domestic violence is a physical assault, um, when in fact, I, I'll go over some um, examples of what that could look like, and, and oftentimes it's not physical at all. Um, and another thing to point out here is that it is never, ever, ever the fault of the person that's being harmed. Uh, everybody deserves to be in a safe and loving relationship um, with their partner. And therefore, um, you know, with domestic violence, the abusers or the abusive partner tends to place blame on the, the partner that's being harmed for the abuse. And the power and control wheel is um, something that advocates use to help a survivor navigate what's been going on in the relationship. Um, it's also helpful for uh, validating what they've been experiencing and, and to provide like definitions for them because they might not know that, you know, they might not know what really isolation looks like until we're talking, you know, we're sitting down one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, and then they could be like, oh, wow, I, you know, I'm being isolated by my partner. Um, and they might think that they're the only ones that are going through this. So this is really helpful for them to realize like it is not their fault and they're not the only ones that are um, experiencing this. So um, on the, on the um, periphery of the, the power control wheel, we have physical violence and sexual violence. Again, it's not, like I mentioned before, it's not always physical violence, um, but it can happen. Um, and in the core of the wheel, we have the power control, right? So it's all about maintaining this power control over one partner. And each piece of the wheel has another example of what um, violence in the relationship could be looking like. Um, and they don't all have to be occurring all simultaneously for it to be um, abuse. So first we'll go through just really quickly intimidation. So that's physical intimidating, um, you know, verbally intimidating. When I worked at a shelter in, in New Jersey, a domestic violence shelter in New Jersey, we had a, a survivor staying with us and her abuser was law enforcement. And so he would lay out his firearm um, when the abuse was, was tend to escalate or was escalating um, to just kind of show her, hey, I have this firearm, right? Um, he didn't have to say anything to her, but he knew that it made her feel uncomfortable and, and he would use that against her. We have emotional abuse. So putting somebody down, um, telling them that they're no good, really tearing down their self-esteem, really tearing down their self-worth. Uh, and this could be done in conjunction with isolation. I always use this example of like, um, if you and your partner are at a family event, right? And my abusive partner is ridiculing me for the dish that I brought and is saying that I did a terrible job on it and is really embarrassing me in front of my family. Uh, maybe my family members come up to me a little later, like, hey, what's going on? Is everything okay? And I go, yeah, no, it's fine. He's just, you know, having a bad day or whatever. Um, the next time that there's a family event, I might think twice about inviting my partner. or I might think twice about going with my partner because I don't know how they're going to react, right? And so I start to isolate myself. I start to not see my friends and family. Um, 
or isolation could happen by physically removing me right from my social systems from my social support so um, moving me and, and and the kids to another state where i don't know anybody um, that would be examples of isolation minimizing denying and blaming is a huge factor of um, an abusive relationship uh, you know blaming me for the abuse um, denying that it ever happened or minimizing it, really gaslighting me, making me wonder like, maybe I'm making a bigger deal of this than, than it really is, or maybe I do deserve the abuse. If we have children in the relationship, using children um, to maintain this power control could look like uh, threatening to take the children away if I try to get a divorce or if I try to leave. Uh, if I'm using alcohol or drugs, saying that they're going to report that and then they'll get um, custody of the children. Again, when I was working at the shelter, we had one woman come stay with us with a few, um, with a few children. And one of her older, I believe he was, you know, preteen, but he was old enough. Um, the father, the abusive partner, made the son abuse mom, right? And so that could be another way of using the children to maintain this power control over one partner. This piece, um, you know, so the original piece here is, is would be called using male privilege, but uh, we can see that this, this wheel is for um, the deaf community. So we see using male or hearing privilege. But I think that really this piece can be using any type of privilege that you have over uh, the relationship. In our society, uh, we're not all equal, unfortunately. There is a social stratification. So using any type of um, whatever privilege you have in our society. So whether it be a male uh, over a female or if one of the uh, if the abusive partner is a is a white person and the person that's being harmed in the relationship is a person of color they can be using that um their racial privilege right by saying go ahead call the cops nobody's going to believe you or um if the relationship is lgbtq and one partner passes as um as um straight they can be using that privilege over their partner Economic abuse, um, this happens the majority of the time. There's, there's usually a lot of economic abuse going on in, domestic, in a domestic violence relationship. So this could look like keeping an allowance or giving me an allowance, not allowing me uh, full access to my bank account. Uh, this could also look like keeping me from working, keeping me from going to school, um, eliminating any steps that I'm trying to take in order to be self-sustainable. Um, it could also look like destroying credit um, or stealing money from me, keeping me away from, you know, keeping me off the bank accounts, things like that. And then we have finally coercion and threats. This is, you know, if you leave me, I'll kill you, I'll kill myself, I'll do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, just any sort of threats that will keep me feeling like I have no other option but to stay in the relationship. So this is, a, you know, understanding the cycle of violence, right? So I was saying before that it's not just one incident, um, but another important thing to, to realize here is that it's constantly cycling through these three uh, stages. So we have the acute explosion or the incident, right? Like whatever happens. And then we have the honeymoon and then we have the tension building, which will eventually lead back into another incident. So in these three um, stages, we see um, the survivor's response and the abusive partner's response. So at the acute explosion, say, um, you know, my partner strangled me. I respond by calling the police and they get arrested. In the honeymoon phase, my partner is calling me from jail, being apologetic. Maybe they're even sending people to the house to threaten me to drop the charges. Um, and they are promising, promising me that it'll never happen again, that they're going to go to church, they're going to go to AA, they're going to go to counseling, they're going to do whatever it is that I want, wanted them to do. Um, and so my response could be, to agree and take them back or go back into the relationship 
or it could be to say, you know, I've had enough um, and this isn't going to happen anymore. But it takes on average about seven times for the for um, a person to leave an abusive relationship. So I just want to keep that in mind or you know, have us keep that in mind. So say I, I let them come back in, I, I you know, get back into the relationship. Then we enter the tension building phase where my partner is, you know, yelling at me or nitpicking or putting me down. There's this feeling of walking on eggshells, things that I need to do in order to calm them down. Um, maybe if we have children, I you know, try to keep the children quiet when when their father is around. So it's just like I'm doing all these things to try to, you know, make sure that nothing else is going to happen again. But unfortunately, it will eventually happen if, if I stay into the relationship. So domestic violence, it cuts across all kinds of relationships. Uh, it cuts barriers of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, education, um, geography. It really doesn't matter um, where we're living, how many degrees we have, right? It, it could still impact us. One in three women and one in four men have experienced physical violence by a partner. One in six women and one in 19 men have been stalked by their partner. And an average of 24 people per minute experience rape, physical violence, or stalking by their intimate partner, which equals out to be 12 million women and men per year. Uh, women ages 18 to 24 and 25 to 34 generally experience the highest rates of DV. Um, and about 30, um, sorry, 43 um, lesbian, 43 percent of lesbian women and 61 percent of bisexual women have experienced physical violence, rape, or stalking, um, and 26 percent of gay men, 37 percent of bisexual men have experienced the same, and transgender folk or people who identify as trans um, are more likely to experience um, DV in public than non-trans uh, folk. We wrapped up our quick little overview of domestic violence. Um, so now we'll get into really the nitty gritty, why we're all here to talk about strangulation. Um, you know, and, it, and it's not something that we normally talk about. It's not something that we usually discuss when I tell people what I do for a living and what I train on. And I say domestic violence and strangulation, they're like, what? What does that mean? Um, a lot of people don't know how frequently it occurs in relationships um, and how dangerous it could possibly be. So strangulation has only been recently identified as one of the most lethal forms of domestic violence. It's been highly minimized for a lot of different reasons, but we now know that almost half of all domestic violence homicide victims have had experience or had experienced at least one um, prior episode of strangulation. And so uh, victims of prior attempted strangulation are seven and a half times more likely of becoming a, a homicide victim by that partner. And that homicide is usually not strangulation, it's usually a gunshot or um, you know, some, some weapon was usually involved. So it's important that we talk about strangulation Number one, because it predicts future homicides. So if we're able to intervene after the first second, right, um, strangulation assault, then we're able to prevent possible uh, future homicides from occurring in that patient um, and client survivor. Another thing that we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about is what strangulation actually is, right? We, tend to hear the words choked more than we hear the word strangulation. But when we hear the words choke, we're actually talking about strangulation, right? So it's often misused. Um, so strangulation is a form of asphyxia characterized by the closure of blood vessels and or air, air passages of the neck as a result of external pressure being placed on the neck. So that's something that's happening externally, right? Something is being placed, pressure is being placed around my neck that is closing off blood flow from my carotid artery, and my jugular vein, and perhaps my trachea, but not all the time, enough so that I lose consciousness. And perhaps um, if, if pressure is continuously placed, I can um, die. 
But strangulation is not choking. Choking is something that's going on internally. Like I choke on a piece of food, I choke on a pill, right? That is something different than something being placed around my neck. Choking obstructs the airways. Strangulation doesn't need to obstruct the airways in order to produce unconsciousness, right? Because we have oxygenated blood flowing to and from my brain, from my heart. And if there is pressure being placed around my neck, that blood flow gets interrupted. And therefore, that's how I lose consciousness. And again, if pressure is continuously placed, I could possibly die. There's going to, um, you know, and another thing that we, we tend to think of strangulation is that there must be some sort of physical signs of the assault. But in fact, about 50% of incidences reported having, um, having physical signs. So somebody coming out of an assault probably won't have that many um, injuries, that many physical injuries. Um, so there's, there could be a lot of things going on internally, which is, you know, we'll get into it a little bit further, but it's very important for somebody to get medical attention. But the lack of physical symptoms on the outside could lead to minimization of the incident by everybody, by everybody involved, by the, um, the survivor, by uh, first responders, if the survivor goes to the hospital a few days after the assault, um, you know, there still might not be any physical signs, so therefore it could also be um, minimized as well. And uh, we also tend to think that a lot of pressure needs to be placed for an extended amount of time, but um, studies have shown that only 11 pounds of pressure is needed on the carotid artery for about 6.8 seconds and 4.4 pounds of pressure on the jugular vein um, to produce unconsciousness. In the next slide, this slide will show you um, different examples of applied pressure. So a handgun trigger pull is six PSIs, opening up a can of soda is 20 PSIs, um, an average adult male handshake is 80 to 100 PSIs, but a maximum adult male handshake is 160 to 180 PSIs. So if we go back real quick, we see 11 pounds per pressure. So it takes more pounds per pressure to open up a can of soda than it does to potentially produce unconsciousness. Um, on somebody. And there's different forms of strangulation. So this is important if we are getting any sort of documentation from a patient about what happened, what did the incident look like. And so there, the different forms of strangulation could be manual, it could be by hand, um, the arm, the elbow, uh, it could be um, in conjunction with suffocation, so sitting on my chest um, or kneeling on my chest while I'm being strangled, it does not allow me to take a full breath from my chest, right? And so I can lose um, consciousness that way as well. Or I could um, obstruct my nasal passageways. I could be um, smothered by something as well. Uh, Ligature form of strangulation is looking at any, any, any object that was placed around my neck. So clothing, something that I was wearing, a scarf, rope, a cord, a piece of jewelry, a belt, anything um, that could uh, be tied around my neck. So it's important that we get this information when somebody says that they've been strangled. Um, and I want to point out, too, that I would be really surprised. It's going to be very rare if if anybody comes into a hospital or you know their primary care and and speaks with their medical provider and says, you know, my partner strangled me manually with two hands. You know, we're going to hear, I was choked, or he choked me, or he put me in a chokehold, or he put me, he pressed up against, um, he you know pushed me up against the wall right with with his hand. Uh, around my neck, or he held me against the wall with my neck, right? So we're going to hear things like that instead of this straight out, you know, very explicit strangulation. So those are cues 
to for for you as a medical provider to ask a little bit more questions what what else is going on and and so these are things that you're you're looking out for how was this done was it by their hand was it something that you were wearing so forth loss of consciousness can occur within um, five to ten seconds and death within two to five minutes again the seriousness of internal injuries may take a few hours um, and delayed death can occur a few days later through um, usually a carotid dissection. And we'll, we'll go over that in a, in a little bit. And these are some survey results of um, strangled women. Um, so this information is, is taken from the Strangulation Training Institute. Um, so you can go on their website and get a lot more information than I'm providing you in these you know, 60, 50 to 60 minutes today. But this survey um, was done in three different locations. I don't know how many women were surveyed, um, but about 68% reported a history of strangulation. And this strangulation, um, the incidents usually occurred three years into the relationship. So, you know, when we go back to what is domestic violence, right, it's not just one incident and it's also um, escalating. The violence tends to escalate in relationships. 87% had experienced, um, had been threatened with death. 88% experienced other types of abuse. Um, so again, you know, it's not just a physical thing. There's other things going on. 70% thought they were going to die during the incident. And 24% uh, 24 of them reported that their abuser had history of strangulation in prior relationships. Most victims or most survivors will suffer injuries to the neck, throat, and face, which makes sense if we think about where the assault is occurring. It's occurring around our neck. So we can see injuries um, internally and externally and to the face. Uh, many survivors present no physical signs of injury, yet many have fractures of the hyoid bone, the larynx, tracheal rings, carotid tears, and occlusions and many survivors will complain of pain um, and swelling and voice changes. So I knew of somebody, um, again, from my experience working at the shelter that she, and this is really before, I mean, I worked there, oh, I don't know, like almost eight years ago. And uh, so this is way before we uh, advocates were even talking about strangulation. Um, so we didn't really know, but now I, you know, now I've been going through these trainings a lot, and and I really wish that we realized it back in the, you know, back then. But one woman that was staying with us, she had just had permanent voice change. It was it was constantly hoarse, um, and she was strangled a few years prior. Um, so we, you know, there there's a lot of things that could happen, and and. I believe it wasn't the first time that she was strangled either. So, you know, it, it could happen potentially uh, with, with future, with um, consistent strangulation assaults. So now we'll go into what to look out for, what, how can we identify the signs and symptoms of strangulation assault, right? I keep on saying, it's not just, um, you know, there's not gonna be a lot of physical signs, but there's gonna be a lot of things going on internally, but there are a few physical signs that we could be looking out for and also some symptoms that are indicative of a strangulation assault. So we'll see the TPI, so the red spots, um, on the skin, again, they're, you know, for those of you who don't know, they're, um, they're there's, um, sorry, they're not raised. So they're not like pimples, they're not acne, um, they're smooth to the skin. And uh, they will be, they'll be seen anywhere where the pressure was placed and then above. So if pressure was placed around my neck, we'll probably see some red spots around my neck, maybe on my chest, but then um, up to my face. Uh, scalp. You can be looking in any of the soft palate of the skin, so the whites of my eyes, inside of my mouth, under my tongue, um, you know, the inside of my cheeks. And it's important to realize here that if we are seeing petechiae, like if we're seeing these broken um, capillaries externally, then there's a good chance that, that they're also occurring um, 
in my brain, on the surface of my brain internally as well. We might see some neck swelling, we might see some nausea, vomiting immediately after the assault, um, or there might be reports of uh, nausea, vomiting. I could have a lot loss or lapse of memory. So like I could be saying things like, I remember we were in the kitchen and then I remember we were fighting in the, in the bathroom, right? So, but I don't remember how we got there. So things like that, where I, it's not, you know, it doesn't make sense, right? There's, there's um, gaps in my memory. Um, I could have a loss of bladder or bowel control, which is another indicator of loss of consciousness. So when we lose consciousness, we just naturally lose control of our bladder and bowel, um, which is um, something that gets denied a lot, right? If, if I was strangled and I lost control of my bladder, um, and maybe I call the police or perhaps a neighbor call the police and they respond and I know that they're responding, I'm probably going to change my clothes, right? Like I'm not going to be wearing something that I soiled myself in. Um, so something that we can ask to see if our patient um, or the survivor lost consciousness, we can ask them, you know, did you, are you wearing the same clothes that you were wearing when the assault happened? Um, and we can normalize it for them. So, you know, when somebody is strangled or when somebody, you know, goes through an incident that you just experienced and they lose consciousness, they also lose control of their bladder or bowels. Did this happen to you? Right. So I'm a little bit more, I feel a little bit more comfortable disclosing to you that this happened. Another sign we can see is a droopy eyelid, um, any uh, seizure, tongue or lip injury, bruising around my mouth voice changes, neck or jaw pain, scalp pain. Um, this could be, you know, from maybe my abusive partner pulled my hair or maybe I hit my head, um, you know, if I, if I lost consciousness and fell down. I could be experiencing sore throat, difficulty breathing or swallowing. I could have a headache. There could be some bruising around my neck, ears or chin. So it's important that when we're, Examining a patient that says that they were strangled or choked, we're not just looking at the neck, right? We're looking all around that, you know, the face and head area, what else is going on. There's sometimes a little bruise underneath the chin, and that's from like a, an instinctual um, defense maneuver where I will dip my chin to block anything from, from reaching my neck. And so therefore, sometimes I'll get some bruising around my chin. Seeing stars or diminishing loss of vision and then loss of hearing is also, they're also indicators of loss of consciousness. And so it's important to know um, if there was a loss of consciousness um, in the documentation. Um, so, you know, you can ask them, you know, did you see any stars or if they, they say something like, um, you know, things kind of went black for a minute or I had trouble hearing or things sounded like they were underwater. Those are, you know, cues for you to, to ask a little bit further about uh, what they remember happening next um, so we can determine whether or not they lost consciousness. And so if anybody, if anybody had, um, or if somebody had all of the signs and symptoms of strangulation, or at least the signs of, of strangulation, this is what they could look like. Um, so we see the mark around the neck indicating a ligature mark, um, and we see fingerprints uh, around the neck. So this could indicate a manual strangulation. We also see scratches around the neck and these usually are defensive wounds. Um, so these are self-inflicted. So it's me, right? It's from my own fingernails, scraping and, and scratching, trying to pull whatever is off my neck. Um, and we see the red spots around my eyes. We see my whole, the white of my eyes, um, bloodshot. Um, and just various bruising around my, my face and neck. So another thing or one thing to point out here when we're looking at, um, when, we're, when we're working with somebody who's, who's strangled and we're looking at strangulation um, is my hippocampus, right? So that's the part of my brain that's important um, and it's, its major job function is to organize and store my memory um, and make sense of it, right? So for today, I know 
everything, I remember everything that brought me to this very moment, right? Like I remember everything in a very linear fashion. So I, you know, remember that A happened, then B happened, then C happened, and now I'm at D, right? When I lose consciousness um, or when I've been through a traumatic event, um, parts of my brain get shut down, right? Like my short-term memory doesn't need to be firing on uh, in order for me to survive uh, an event. So if I'm walking across the street and I see a bus coming, my short-term memory is like shutting down, right? Like it needs, my brain needs to go into full um, fight, flight or freeze mode, right? In order to survive that um, that incident. Same thing with an assault. Anything that traumatic is happening to us, parts of our brain shut down so that we can just focus on surviving. Um, but it's also, the hippocampus is also sensitive to lack of oxygen. So when I lose consciousness, it's because my brain is not getting blood flow and therefore it's not, um, you know, it's, it doesn't have any oxygen. So when that gets shut down and uh, when it comes back on line, so to speak, I will have trouble remembering what happens, right? Um, if I was in a car accident, I can remember, you know, where I was before the, the accident and then a little bit after the accident, but not really, I can't really remember the actual accident happening, right? Everything happens so quickly and again, your brain shuts down. Same thing if I lose consciousness. I wake up and I have no idea what happens. Um, but not only that, my memory after that, it's not so much linear anymore. It's, it's you know, I, I remember a little bit of B and then I kind of remember some A and then some C, right? So when we're working with somebody who was strangled and definitely lost consciousness, we can ask them certain questions to help them remember the actual incident and what happens. So instead of asking questions like, you know, what happened next? I don't know what happened next. I can't remember. So something could be, um, so an alternative question could be, what do you remember happening next? And therefore, like, it doesn't have to necessarily be in any particular order, um, but the more that I explain what I remember happening, perhaps it'll jog my memory a little bit more. Um, another way to help me remember stuff is by asking me what I remember hearing, what I remember seeing, what I remember smelling, what I remember feeling, right? To kind of piece together the incident with all these other details that my brain has like cataloged, but it hasn't fully made sense of it yet, right? So when we're working with somebody, and this is really important for law enforcement, um, but you know, with anybody who's working with a survivor of strangulation, that we remember that, or you know, we have to remember that if somebody comes back to us a few days later and says, I remember this happening, I remember a part of the incident now, they're not making it up, they're not, you know, filing a false report, their brain has gone through some damage, right? And so now they're, they're making sense of what had happened and their memory is, is constructing it in a, in a different, you know, slower than, than what we would like, obviously, but, you know, just, our survivors need our assistance, our survivors need our support in helping to remember. Um, so that's just important to keep in mind when we're working with somebody. If they don't remember what had happened, that's okay. There are ways that we can help them remember. And if they remember a few days later, then that's great too. We shouldn't dismiss that. There's some long-term health impacts that could be happening from strangulation assaults, some neurological damage, um, miscarriages, heart attack, delayed death from carotid dissection, um, if you know, if our if our audience is full of medical providers, I'm sure we know what a carotid dissection is. But just in case, it's basically when your carotid artery is torn, right, and uh, our blood clots. But that clot now is traveling up to my brain could potentially uh, lead to a stroke or some um, lethal um, event, right? That we need to uh, catch before it, before it can happen. So. One thing to do uh, when somebody reports or comes in maybe to an ER and says that they were strangled or choked 
is to uh, run a CTA scan with contrast, just so we can see what's going on with the arteries, just so we can see what's going on internally, um, see if there's any, any tears, so that we can potentially um, eliminate uh, a death from, from occurring. Some other long-term health impacts, uh, fractured hyoid bone, vocal cord immobility, um, you know, and PTSD, depression, anxiety, behavioral changes. I didn't list these, but we see that occurring as well. So to wrap up our strangulation section, um, you know, just to go over some strangulation myths and facts, and these are things that we really just talked about. So myth number one, strangulation or choking, um, Strangulation and choking are the same thing, when in fact it's not. Strangulation, external pressure, preventing blood flow, and choking is an internal blockage. Myth number two, strangulation always leaves visible injuries. And the fact is that studies show over half of strangulation assaults leave no visible injury. Um, but again, what's going on internally is something that we really have to look out for. Um, and without the visible injuries, the assault tends to get minimized. Right? So we have to make sure that our patients are understanding um, the impact of the strangulation assault, that they are more likely to be future homicide victims, right? that the um, abuse can escalate potentially if they don't um, you know, try to explore options of leaving. If somebody um, can speak, scream, talk, or breathe, they're not being strangled. Uh, the fact is that since strangulation involves the obstruction of blood flow, somebody can still be breathing or feel like they're breathing, um, and they could uh, be talking and screaming, et cetera, and still be, um, still be strangled. Myth number four, strangulation can't be harmful because it's practiced in martial arts, military, and law enforcement. In fact, all of the above use strangulation as a form of lethal force during or during combat. And in fact, some police departments across the United States are either in conversation about banning the use of chokeholds or have banned the use of chokeholds in their departments um, because they know how dangerous it is. And finally, myth number five, survivors of strangulation should be able to detail their attack. We just went through this with the hippocampus. Um, both trauma and lack of oxygen prohibits memory from being stored and organized correctly. Therefore, it's very common for a survivor to not be able to detail their attack or remember it um, fully right away. So what more can we do as providers, as um, medical providers or as neighbors, as friends, as family, right? What, what more can we do? Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go over some advocacy tips, but, but really, you know, screening is the most important uh, thing that we can do as medical providers. Uh, it's important to screen because it decreases morbidity and mortality. So it decreases the chance and the risks of other health and um, other health issues that are associated with domestic violence and strangulation, but it also decreases um, death from abuse and strangulation. And it's important to remember that as healthcare providers, that you might be one of the very few people in a survivor's life to have one-on-one -on -one time with them without the violent partner. Right, so if we go back to the beginning and we're talking about the power and control wheel, we saw how isolation can manifest in a violent relationship and how it perpetuates the violence. So you are eliminating that isolation in the survivor by asking them if they're safe, by asking them if certain things were going on in the home. And it opens up the door for the patients um, and plant seeds for them to feel comfortable about seeking help. It might just be, it might not be with you at that very moment, but maybe in the future, maybe in a month or so when they feel like they're more ready, um, they can come back to you or come back to your practice or come back to your, um, the hospital or the office because they know that since you asked about it and you felt comfortable asking about it, that told them that you are able to have a conversation with them, right? And it also shows that you um, care about their, their safety and you're, you're placing importance on their safety. They might not, it might have been a really long time 
right, for them to hear that somebody cares about them, especially if they've been in a relationship um, with an abusive partner for a really long time, for decades. Um, so it's important that you, you express that to them. It's also cost effective. So this is a study pulled from the Journal of Trauma at Johns Hopkins. Um, so when compared to not screening, implementing a strategy of a CTA scan to screen for patients um, that are a high risk for blood cerebral vascular injuries, it decreased the stroke rate by 10%. And it also provided savings, right? Like everything's about money, but really because stroke patients require rehab after discharge. Um, and they also have a 20% um, stroke-related stroke related mortality rate, so that decreased as well. So it's, you know, it's decreasing the need for resources, right, to be put into our communities, but it also decreases um, the mortality rate. But one thing that we have to remember when we are screening for strangulation or DV, that there's a lot of barriers to leaving abuse. Number one is fear. When somebody leaves a, a domestic violence relationship or makes that step towards disconnecting from their abusive partner, their risk of um, risk of being a homicide victim or being a victim of a, of a serious assault increases. So when somebody says that they're fearful of their partner, we should definitely take that seriously. And we shouldn't minimize that. Um, and then, you know, I, I couldn't couldn't fit safety planning into here, but um, I can also provide you some resources um, so you can educate yourself on safety planning as a medical provider. Um, but they don't know where to go. They don't know if people are going to believe them. They might have financial issues. They might be medically reliant on their partner. So maybe they have a mental illness or their partner provides money for their medications. They might be uh, hesitant about the legal system or the criminal justice system. Maybe they are a person of color who has had um, previous negative experiences. Maybe they're LGBTQ or maybe they're um, undocumented and they're really afraid of being picked up by ICE, which is a real concern nowadays. So there's a lot of reasons that we need to take into consideration. It's not just easy to, you know, it's not as easy as saying, you know, why don't you just leave? There's a lot of reasons why somebody might not be able to at that very moment. And for screening, we have to remember that screening is not, um, disclosure is not the goal with screening. Uh, survivors say that they want providers to be non-judgmental. They want them to listen, offer information and support, and don't push for disclosure, right? The more that you push, the more that the survivor is going to pull back and not trust you or not feel comfortable about talking to you or going back to you. So a patient may be presenting, if they haven't fully disclosed yet, they may feel a little frightened, ashamed, or evasive, embarrassed. Um, if the partner is accompanying the patient and you know, answering questions for the patient, that's a huge red flag about something else is happening with these two people within their relationship. Um, and they might uh, take responsibility for the abuse. They might say, yeah, you know, he choked me, but I deserved it. You know, I, I did, you know, I fought back and I shouldn't have done that. Um, another thing that to keep a lookout for is there might be multiple stages, um, sorry, multiple injuries at various stages of healing. So that would be a, a, another indicator that something else is going on in the relationship. Some questions that you can ask um, if somebody disclosed to you that they were strangled. We will ask them, or we can ask them um, how many times they've been strangled, how many times their partner strangled them, um, and how were they strangled, what method, and provide examples, you know, right hand, left hand, was it with their hands, was it with something that you were wearing, clothing rope, um, did you experience the following, um, so, you know, try to gauge whether or not they lost consciousness, did they lose bodily functions? And again, I, I provided a scenario of how you can normalize that and say, you know, when somebody is, is choked or strangled and they lose consciousness, they oftentimes lose control of their bladder or bowels. Did that happen to you? Was anyone present while you were being choked or strangled? Um, did the abuser say anything? Did you experience any of the following immediately after? And this is important because we want to make note of gradual changes of symptoms um, over a period of time. 
And it's also important to, if, if you're able to, um, or if the survivor is able to, to take pictures of their injuries over a period of time. So if they can take a picture of their injuries, um, you know, the day of the assault, a few days after, a week after, right, just to notice the, the changes um, for law enforcement if they are pressing charges. Um, you can ask them if law enforcement was involved and if they sought medical attention, be, you know, before, you know, seeing you, if, if you are, you know, attending to, to their injuries. We see a lot of times survivors won't go right away that they'll they'll wait a few days or maybe even weeks. Usually they'll they'll see an advocate, like a domestic violence advocate, who will encourage them to go get medical care. And that usually um, you know, encourages them to go. There's some actions that you can do after the disclosure, um, thanking the patient for for sharing and convey empathy, letting them know that it was probably really hard for them to talk about it. And to let them know, you know, connect the violence that they're experiencing with any health issues um, that they're experiencing. And let them know that you're going to support them in the next steps, whether that be talk to a DB advocate, whether it be talk to the social worker at the hospital or, you know, get in a shelter or go back home. Right. Sometimes that's their only option at that very moment. But you can address your immediate safety concerns with them because they could be minimizing the abuse, but it could also be a very legitimate that they can't leave at that very moment. Um, so just address it with them. And then you can refer to a DV advocate for additional support, right? You don't have to do this all alone. Um, but some things that you can do, um, connect with your local domestic violence and sexual assault organizations. Um, I know in New Jersey, Every county has their own lead domestic violence and sexual assault organization. I don't know how it is out of state, um, but connect with them. Ask them if they have any materials that you can put out in your waiting rooms or exam rooms so that if I'm a patient and I'm experiencing violence in my relationship and there's a brochure sitting right next to me saying, are you experiencing violence in your relationship? I might be a little more comfortable talking to my provider about that, knowing that they have these materials in the room. Um, you can also ask the organizations if they provide presentations on screening. Like that's my whole role too, right? With the Family Justice Center, I provide presentations and trainings. Um, and so oftentimes they're more than willing to come out and train somebody on how to appropriately respond to domestic violence or sexual assault. Learn your local hotline numbers so that you can, it's readily available so that you can provide it to um, your patients. So you're not you know, Googling it in front of them or asking you know, somebody else for it. Um, if you have like any sort of safety cards that have the hotline number on, that's even great. So you can just give it right to the um, patient. And educate the patient on the severity of the assault. A lot of them will, you know, tend to, they don't want to think that's going to happen again. Um, but we know that it could lead to homicide. And we know that violence in the relationship um, escalates and increases over time. So it's really important that we educate them. We educate them too, you know, so that they have their own language, that they can make informed decisions about their health. And uh, one thing to just remember that CTA uh, with contrast is, has been stated as the gold standard for checking for carotid dissections. And just wrapping up, these are some ways that you can connect. So this is the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Um, and then for our folks in New Jersey, but out of Essex, uh, the New Jersey Domestic Violence Hotline number. So how these two hotline numbers work, you just say what county, what state you're in, and then they patch you right through to their local domestic violence organization. Um, so this could be um, given to your patients, but you can also call them to see if they have any information that they can send you. And for um, my New Jersey Essex County um, friends. This is our 24-hour domestic violence hotline number. And then this is the organization that I'm with, the Essex County Family Justice Center. For pre-COVID, um, pre we're a walk-in center, but now during COVID, we're all remote, but we're still fully available over the phone. And I think that is it with five minutes for questions and answers. And with that, I will um, 
turn back on my camera. Thank you, Danielle, for a really enlightening um, and thorough look at the topic. Um, as you said, I, I know there are a lot of people that are, are not as familiar with um, strangulation, so this has really been great. And I also really appre appreciate all of the resources that you shared. Um, and it was perfect timing. So we have uh, a couple of questions um, before we wrap things up. And the first one uh, we're asking, I'm sure is on everybody's mind, have you seen an increase in uh, strangulation uh, because of COVID? Yeah, so I, I know that our organization has definitely seen an increase in numbers, right? There's definitely been an increase in people reaching out to us, um, and that's just been across the board, right? People are more isolated uh, during COVID, especially earlier in the year when everybody was on lockdown, right? And nobody was really working, um, or if they were working, they're working from home. And so, incidentally, they were on lockdown with their abusers, right? And they were less connected with the outside world. So we definitely saw an increase from that, for sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, I know last week's program was on uh, screening and the speaker talked a lot about documentation, um, but can you speak to a little bit about what types of things health professionals should be sure that they include in documentation? Yeah, so if we have to make sure um, well, it, we don't really have to, but it would be helpful to, to see if our medical documentation was being used um, in the uh, criminal side, right? So if, if the patient is pressing charges and moving forward with any criminal charges, if our um, documentation is being used for that. So we, uh, I know some, some people have like actual body maps, right? Some Practitioners have body maps, so where they, you know, it's like a full outline of the body and then, or like the neck and head, we can document where the injuries are on this body map or on this face map. Um, we we want to use our patients' words, but we want them used in quotations, right? So if I'm the patient and I'm saying I was choked, you're going to say patient says quote unquote choked, right? Um, but then as a medical provider, I'm going to use the term, like I'm going to use the correct term strangulation, right? Manual strangulation, literature strangulation. Um, so we want to document everything that the patient is saying, but we also want to make sure that we're differentiating between what I'm saying as a medical provider and what the patient is saying by using those quotations. Got it. Got it. I know you talked um, a little bit about the diff well, a lot actually about the difference between choking and strangulation. But how? What is the best way to educate uh, patients on the difference between these two terms? Yeah, I think just saying, um, like, kind of using it in context, right? Like, um, it's something like I or you choke on a piece of food, or you choke on. I think I use the, the example pill. Right, like it's something that is happening internally. I always say it's happening. Choking is something that's happening internally. Strangulation is external. So just kind of, you know, allow them to say choked, and then you know, ask them more about it, and be like, oh, okay, so that's actually strangulation. And when we talk about strangulation, we mean this. And when we talk about choke, we mean this. Right. Okay. <clears throat> well, we are out of time, so I think we're going to end it here. Um, okay. Thank you again for a great presentation. I also want to thank everybody who's been on the webinar, as well as Laura Hall, who's been providing back-end technical assistance, and I know taking care of any of the questions that viewers have, have sent in as far as uh, technical issues. Um, just a reminder to everyone that in a, within an hour, you'll receive an email and that will have a link to the post program evaluation and certificate out uh, within a week of today. Um, a calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found on our website at www.partnershipmch.org. That's under the educational, uh, professional education tab. We also offer on-demand recordings of many of our programs, which are listed there as well. And this program will be downloaded as a recording and available on the website. 
our domestic violence webinar series concludes in two weeks, so that will be October 29th, with a presentation on recognizing the signs of teen dating violence. Next week, on October 22nd, we hope you'll join us to learn more about preventing flu this season. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you at a future event.